In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, we continue our reading in the spiritual meadow. O heavenly King, comfort the spirit of truth, who art everywhere present, and fillest all things, treasury of good things, and giver of life. Come and dwell in us, and cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls, O good one. Chapter 221. <clears throat> this is from the Supplementary Tales. A brother gave all his goods away when he became a monk, but retained one fine piece of land. A distinguished layman longed to possess that land, and he frequently asked the monk either to sell it to him or to take another piece of land in exchange for it, but neither alternative was acceptable. Now the layman became governor of that region, and he brought pressure to bear on the monk to give up that land. He threatened him often and put his own cattle on the other's land. When the monk perceived the extent of the danger he was in and his inability to frustrate the governor, in the end he went off to an elder who led a solitary life in those parts, a virtuous and celebrated man. The brother was in the habit of coming to him. The elder would encourage him and send him back to his cell. Realizing that the governor was determined to have the land, he became yet again. He came yet again to the elder and said to him, Help me for the Lord's sake. Write to him or send somebody to him. When the brother continued to trouble him with this request, the elder wrote a letter to the governor which went like this. The person who lives the life of a monk does so in order to be rid of possessions on account of which he might be wronged. Having written thus, he gave the letter to the brother to take to the governor, and the brother was unaware of what the writing said. He went and gave it to the governor, who received it with great honor. He reverenced it, opened it, and read it. Then he asked the brother, Do you know what he wrote? That you would desist from encro encroaching on that land of mine, said the, said the other. In his amazement at the virtue of the elder, the governor did desist from encroaching on the land. From this example, let us wonder at the goodness of God and the nature of virtue. For the elder wrote a letter which contained nothing haughty or threatening, and yet it constrained the archon, the ruler in other words, to have pity on the one who requested it. Now, this particular story is truly edifying because we see that the brother, for some unknown reason, held on to a piece of land which would be contrary to all the known customs of the monastic ascetics, the strugglers, because we know of another story when a monk came, I think maybe to St. Anthony the Great, and said... I have a few pieces of gold remaining. Shall I bring them with me to the desert? And St. Anthony told them, Go and wrap yourself with raw meat, tie it to yourself, and come back. As the brother was coming back, dogs attacked him because they smelt the raw, smelled the raw meat, and they were biting the monk, the, or the young man wanting to become a monk. So he came to St. Anthony and complained bitterly, saying, I got bitten by dogs on the way here. And St. Anthony looked at him and said, well, in the same way that the dogs were smelling the raw meat and were biting you, the demons would see the golden coins that you possess and would try to attack you. So that young man went and he gave the gold away before he became a monastic. But in this case, we see something rather amazing. The young brother held on to the land. The elder wrote what he wrote, and the ruler, out of respect for the elder, left the young monk alone, realizing perhaps that, for whatever reason, uh, he was holding on to the land, and uh, it wasn't really the way of the monastic life, but he had pity on him for the sake of the elder's writing. Now, I know of another story where I think either Piman the Great or one of the great saints had a nephew, and the governor wanted to see the monk in town. He wanted him to come for something. So he took the nephew, arrested him, and put him into prison. The sister of the great saint pleaded and begged and said, please go and speak to the governor so that my son would be released. And it's possible that either he sent a letter or the governor sent someone for a message, like a messenger. And the monk basically said, I'm dead to the world and 
Worldly affairs do not concern me. When the governor heard that, he released the nephew and left the monastic alone, realizing that he couldn't manipulate him using familiar uh, ties, the, the familial connections. So in this particular case, even though the elder wrote what he wrote to the governor, which would seem to condemn the young monk, the governor had pity on him. Glory to God. Chapter 222. Some philosophers once visited an elder, and after he had offered a prayer, he remained silent, braiding cord and paying no attention to them. They besought him, saying, Say something to us, Father. But he held his peace. They said to him, This is what we came for, to hear you say something and benefit from it. The elder said to them, You spend your money to learn how to speak. I left the world to learn how to keep silent. They were filled with amazement on hearing this and went their way edified. This story is truly both short and very precise. Amazingly enough, there is an understanding that there is true philosophy, in other words, true love of wisdom, and then there is what's called a sophistry, or the art of clever speaking. Now, we don't know whether the young men, in fact, were sophists by way of their lives, and yet they were greatly edified when the elder said to them, you are walking around learning how to speak well, but I left to go into the desert learning how to be silent. Now, this particular silence, of course, is not silence only of words, but most importantly, it's the silence of thoughts. We know from the Holy Scriptures that when God spoke to the prophet, when I think it was the prophet Elias, it was the still small voice. It wasn't thunder. It wasn't lightning. It was a quiet voice with which God spoke. Very often in our souls and our minds and our heart, hearts, God also speaks with a still small voice. And if we are perturbed continuously by various loud thoughts, and I think that we all understand the concept of quiet and loud when it comes to our physical hearing, yet I think that even with our thoughts, we could say loud and quiet as well. There are some thoughts that are very much at the forefront, sort of screaming and yelling at us, demanding our attention, and some thoughts that are somewhere sort of off in the back, quiet, barely present. God's voice is still. And that's why the elder said, I came out here to learn how to be silent so that in this silence, he could hear the voice of God. And that is something I think that we are lacking tremendously. We are surrounded by a myriad of notifications social networks, uh, news feeds, and, and so on and so forth. We're so distracted. And in this distraction, we lose both God and we even lose ourselves. We can't even sometimes hear the voice of our own conscience, which is a true disaster. So with that, let us also, just like the elder said, try to learn silence. And I think we could receive tremendous benefit from that. Perhaps if you're interested and if you'd like to leave a comment, maybe you could tell me what your thoughts are about the young monk who was holding on to the piece of land and whether uh, that was good or bad. What do you think? And, and uh, if you had to give him advice, what would you tell him? Well, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, through the prayers of thy most pure mother, of our holy and God-bearing fathers, of our holy and God-bearing father, John Moscus, and of all the saints, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Thank you, dear brothers and sisters, for joining. Thank you for your support. Thank you so much for your prayers. Please continue.